Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, my name is Victor Obasaki. Uh, I'm a member of the LBJ Future Forum board. Uh, on behalf of the entire board, welcome to the Future Forum and thanks for joining us for a conversation, Austin bombings, uh, race and the media. Now the forum, for those of you who aren't members, I see a lot of members out there, but for those of you who are not, uh, we're an organization that strives to connect people. People of various backgrounds, uh, experiences, know-how, and points of view. And we do that so as to thoughtfully discuss local, state, national topics that affect our communities and our society. We aim to make spaces for fair and informative dialogue. Uh, the forum's events are made possible by dedicated members as well as sponsors, um, including the Texas Monthly, Carbock Brewing, Austin Wine Merchant, and Joe Cook's Catering. So, so thank you members and thank you sponsors. And speaking of membership, we are a membership supported organization. So I strongly encourage you to uh, join tonight. Um, you can find one of the board members or members and, and uh, find out how to do that. But um, please do that. Uh, we, and to speak to some of the things that, that members get is early access to happy hours, events, uh, networking opportunities, as well as benefits here at the LBJ Presidential Library. So um, really worth it, uh, not just because there are great people involved, but there are great things to, to be had as well. Um, and speaking of uh, events, upcoming events include the sixth annual Easter egg roll uh, on the lawn of the library, which is a really great family event. Uh, I encourage you to make it out. Um, as well as uh, the Women in Leadership, annual Women in Leadership event is slated for late May, and it's a, it's a really special event every time. So please join us for that. Um, now, I really look forward to hearing from our guests tonight. Uh, they're you know, an esteemed group of folks who I think could speak um, really well to this particular topic. Please note that you will get the opportunity to speak at the end of the panel, so uh, avoiding interruptions and what have you would be great. Um, and, and let me just quickly tell you who will be um, on the panel. It will be moderated by Ernest Smith of UT Journalism, UT Austin Journalism, uh, Eric Tang of Black Studies here at UT Austin, uh, Delia, Delia Jones of uh, KUT, forgive me, and uh, editor John Bridges of The Statesman. Um, so uh, please welcome them all to the stage. Yeah, and that, that does remind me, please silence your your devices, if you would, or at least vibrate. Thank you. They left off the other Eric. Yeah, two Eric's. Two Eric's, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. My name is Erna Smith. As you know, I'm a lecturer in the journalism department. I'm also a little bit out of breath because I just got through teaching a class, so I hope you'll, we're going to come quietly back into the room. I think this is a, a very interesting topic. I will just tell you a story. I uh, lived in Austin. My parents moved to Austin in 1970. I lived here uh, until 1975, and then I went away different places, and I moved back here in 2015. And for me, one of the most stunning things about returning to Austin after all that time was what I call the disappearance of actually the African-American community in any sort of frame or fashion that I had seen before. And when this pipe bomb, uh, pipe bomb bombing started, uh, there was even more of a sense of, of that loss because I know if I had been here in 1970 and this had happened, um, there would have been, uh, I would have known exactly where to go 
to find out. Um, and so I think within the context of this story is also, I think, largely a, also a story about the changing demographics of the city and how it's impacted uh, the ability of media to actually cover these things. It's all problematic. Race has always been a problematic topic, I think, for media to cover. But I think sort of even more so uh, between uh, what I consider to be the um, the Africanization of, <laughs> of Austin, for lack of better words, and the complete uh, drop-off in terms of revenue and resources for reporting. We have a really great panel here that's going to talk about various aspects of it. But since it was supposed to be essentially a panel that speaks to the media, I was wondering if we might just do a first round with everyone about what do you think were the um, particular issues in media that particularly struck you as um, a problematic or, uh, uh, or whatever. So um, we have uh, Delaya Jones here from uh, NPR. So we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, oh, I think you have a mic on. Do I? Yeah, oh, you yeah. Your mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there we go. Um, I think that the biggest issue uh, for us was, of course, the terrorism label, um, but also just kind of doing rumor control. Um, it, I, I even talked to my editor about this. Um, if we could have done this differently. I think that we would have kind of tried to discuss this a little bit more with, with the community, right? We would have had the community ask us questions, right? Um, because at the time when we didn't know who was doing all these bombings, um, a lot of Reddit rumors were going on. You see a lot of um, fake news on Twitter, Facebook. Um, so I think that that was the biggest issue is just having accurate information um, and making sure that you're using a dependable source to get that information. So. John Bridges, you are now the editor of American Statesman. Yeah, so I was managing editor um, this time last year. And I, I think the biggest issue in this story was that it, was, it, it played out over 19 days of just uh, going from the unknown and the mystery of the first bombings to the holy shit moment of the second and third bombings. Um, to the rest of it where we were all realizing that this could strike any of us um, and just the unknown aspects of this. And so um, we were running around from dawn till dawn at times. Um, at, the, at the very end, I got a call at 3.11 in the morning um, from Tony Plahetsky saying he's dead. <laughs> and I knew pretty much what he meant. Um, it, it was that aspect of it that it was just we didn't know, we didn't know what we know now. We really don't know a whole lot now, to no, tell you the truth. Um, but that aspect of it, that being able to look in hindsight at some things is, is very helpful. But in the moment, um, we didn't know a whole lot. And for a while there, we weren't being helped a whole lot by the police department. Um, and they've, they've fessed up to that in some ways. Um, but yeah, that, just the not knowing and the running around trying to cover something with events happening all over, all over the city. Eric Tang and then Eric Bird. <laughs> I think the most interesting and problematic aspect of the media coverage during the crisis was the fact that you had for the first two victims who were African-American men, actually Draylon Mason, a boy. A boy. A boy. A boy. And then um, his mother, Shamika Wilson, severely injured during that same incident. And then the fourth victim severely injured, um, Ms. Herrera. Four black and brown victims in historic east side of Austin, and yet it was almost um, painful for the media to talk about race unless there could be some threshold of hate crimes evidence reached in order you know, to, to justify um, the discussion of race. So I, I wonder if we needed to actually reach that threshold in order to have a substantive conversation about racial terror that comported with the fears 
of those on the historic black and brown east side. Um, Eric Bird, Measure Austin. Um, I'm a native Austinite, so I was born and raised here. Uh, been here and in San Marcos, which is technically here now, um, <laughs> for most of my life, um, all of my life. And I have to echo exactly what the other panelists have said. Um, is the first thing that stuck out to me was that the bomber was um, portrayed as this normal, everyday American kid who um, went to school and had friends. And I mean, I know so many of his friends just by reading articles and so many of the people close to him. Um, but I know very little about the victims. All I knew at the time and all most of my social media sources and where I get most of my media, um, all they knew was that the victims were primarily black and brown, that they looked like us. And in East Austin, where uh, the population of black people are shrinking, even though the population of Austin is growing, um, it's scary to see that two black people, a child, um, that they were targeted and they were hit. It's hard for us as black people to even find black people to socialize with. Um, but for, for that to be a random happenstance is, is very unlikely, and we knew that. Um, and so when it comes to credible media sources, um, reaching out and talking to the people, like you said, I think that would be the best, um, the best course of action at that point. Um, don't, have, don't talk about us or discuss us or have an issue that affects us without us. Um, so get our opinion and uh, see how we feel and see what our fears are and um, share it with people to let, you know, hey, everybody else is having this fear too. We don't know yet, but it's, um, it's valid. You know, the, you mentioned uh, Norman Mason's grandson. He is actually the cousin of uh, my great nieces and nephews. And, the week that that happened, um, I, I, I uh, talked to the 16-year-old, um, and uh, he, um, he asked, why didn't anybody care about him? And it was his cousin. You know, it, the way it happened, it could have happened to him. And he asked me, why doesn't anybody care? And you know, I told him I cared about him. But it doesn't play out. He doesn't, he doesn't sense that from me. He is 16, of course, and he has different feelings. But um, I just wanted to share that, that this was an incredibly impactful uh, event for people personally. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the notion of not being able to see himself, so there is a, a role for media. I would argue, in terms of media today, though, that um, uh, so much of it more now is... Uh, personal and um, it's social. You know, messaging for young people now is not through the statesman or through the television, it's, it's in their own media. So I'm a big advocate of people making their own media. Um, uh, I wanted to talk though about the things that would affect the coverage. I also have covered uh, depiction of race in media and there's a number of things that affect that sort of framing and as I looked at it, I just saw the similar frames. For me, what struck me was that it seemed like it took a long time to, or was it ever called a, um, a hate crime? Was it no. ever described by uh, Yeah, I don't think it was ever. It was described Catholic. eventually as domestic terror after yeah. the fact. Yeah. After the fact, after the fact. Um, I was also curious as to what happened between the first bombing and the second bombing. So the first one was covered like a, a cop story, am I correct? Yeah. yeah, I so thought it was a, a drug, it was drug related. Uh, I think that a few days earlier they had um, like did a drug raid or something and then they thought that that bombing was connected to it uh, because the house was similar. So. Yeah, so the first the, the first one is, is I think the biggest yeah. regrettable part of this whole thing in terms yeah. of coverage. Um, the, the, the bombing that, that killed Stefan House. Um, so it, it originally, we reported it as what, what Police reported it, or, or the first responders reported it as, as a home explosion, mm -hmm. and um, you know what goes through your mind as a as a newspaper reporter or editor is natural gas or meth lab. Mm -hmm. I mean, those those are usually why homes explode, um, and so that that first day. Uh, there was no mention of package bomb, anything like that. Um, this is where I think the police 
very much regret their handling of this, and it, it misled us, frankly. Um, the next uh, thing we were hearing was this bit about a, there had been a drug bust or drug something down the street. So they were wondering if this was a retaliatory hit or something when you gone, say, gone wrong. When so say they, were the source of those rumors the police? Police, yeah, right. yeah. police. Okay. Um, and they didn't use uh, Mr. House's name until I believe Monday or Tuesday. This happened on Friday. Um, Monday or Tuesday. So like all this time goes by where it's a known victim. And, and police um, active, you know, said in a press conference that, that um, you know, they, they were trying to figure out or could not rule out that the victim had caused this himself as if he were building a bomb and it blew up or whatever you do on a Friday morning. Um, so that, I think that put us all in a weird place to start with in terms of what are we talking about here? Because you, you don't go to serial bomber. You don't, go to, you don't even go to package bomber. I mean, that, that's never happened. Um, and, it, and, and police didn't go there as well. They, they went to, let's start with the victim and start working our way out because that's what we usually do in homicide cases. Um, and like I said, they didn't even use his name for a couple of days there. And uh, yeah, for, for me, the biggest regret in this whole thing was not pressing in that period more, uh, pressing harder against this or just it, talking, it wasn't even an official narrative, the yeah. official non-narrative yeah. that was coming out. Or just talking to neighbors, right? Um, so mm. this year, um, well, a few weeks ago, I actually visited with some of House's neighbors. Um, and this woman named um, Monica, she told me that whenever she heard about the bombing um, and she saw this correlation that APD had kind of put out about this drug raid and all of that. She was like, that was so weird. She was like, he was just so nice. You know, it, he didn't look like he had been involved in anything. They knew about the house, a few houses down that was, you know, potentially involved in drugs, uh, with drugs. But she said the way that APD had kind of painted the, the picture um, just didn't seem right. Um, and this isn't and I didn't just talk to her, I talked to a couple of neighbors who thought that was kind of weird. Uh, so I think that we, as the media, could have done a, a better job of just kind of talking to the people around him. Yeah, um, and we tried. Yeah. We, tr we tried yeah. and failed um, to reach people who, who could the, the identify time. him. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, through that weekend. And, but I don't think we did as good job that week. So it happened on a Friday. Yeah. You know, weekends aren't great, great for us. We don't do our best. We were thinly staffed and we have to intentionally say, go follow that thing that happened. Um, so I think we did not do a good job that weekend. But, and, then, and then coming into the next week, we were trying to get people to tell us about the victim, and we didn't do a very good job there. And then stories began to come out that, you know, this wasn't a meth lab, this wasn't a drug dealer, this was a president of his homeowners association and all this kind of stuff. Right, but if you had, not you, mm, anyone sure. in particular, but we had, dug one level deeper, uh, it would have been easily revealed that House was a relative mm -hmm. of a well-established yeah. African-American mm -hmm. political Actually, when I, I saw his, when I saw his name, I thought, is he related to him? Yeah, because it's a small town, really. Mm -hmm. And um, you wonder then whether or not there would have been more care given to the narrative from the outset had his connections to various African-American civic leaders in Austin been more, um, been on the table sure. earlier. Well, you have to have people in the room who would know that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I, 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 Eric, uh, Bird, I wonder if you want to jump in here because I was going to ask a question about who works where. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with um, Dr. Tang. I believe that, um, Asking those questions is important, digging deep, and I, see, I noticed you, you made an effort, um, but it seems like it was well known or his family is so well established. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe what was the care, what level of care um, did you take in this case and in the future, you know, yeah. where's it going to go? 
I would like to ask to what degree do who's in the room uh, brings that knowledge. I, I, my sister worked with the statesman for many years. Uh, I'm sure if she had been there, she would have probably said immediately, known who Susan is, who, she wouldn't have known who he was. So I'm curious to what degree do you believe that who's in the room and the economic downturn in media has affected, uh, further affected the ability to sort of get a, a story like that? John? Yeah, I would ask him, yeah. I'm a rookie. Sure, so for us, um, <laughs> there are fewer people in the room, period. Yeah. period. Um, and um, that's especially so, say, over a weekend, um, where we're skeleton staffed and with generally our youngest staffers. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't recall, I know I was off that Monday, which was, um, I went back and was looking because I knew there was something weird there where I came in at the middle of the week and said, why haven't we done more on who this guy is? Um, and we were, our attempts to do more, uh, for whatever reason, came up pretty dry. Um, I think so a I don't lot know, of outlets I don't know that, covered it pretty minimally. Like we, it was yeah. kind of like a mention. Yeah, there were. The statesman wasn't yeah. alone. Yeah. No, there yeah. were some yeah. other some other people got to we, some of these did, aspects we before we did. Uh, not, I, I don't recall whom. Well, we we mentioned it briefly on air, but. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like the no, I think like I think the TV stations probably had like the yeah. he was a homeowner. Some of these some of these things that didn't fit with what cops were leading us to believe. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think who's in the room uh, matters and who knows whom in the community yeah. is important. And um, yeah, that, I think that is across media today is, um, is a problem because there are fewer of us and there are fewer of us who are um, uh, of an age that we're connected into various communities, whatever they are. Um, we have more people who are, you know, a couple years out of school or whatever. Um, we all do. Sorry, Eric, but can, can I mention no, please. I would also say that not only who's in the room, but kind of the demographic makeup of who's in that room, right? Oh, yeah. um, we, in our newsroom, we have plenty of people from Austin, right? Um, but we don't have anybody from the black community, Asian community, Hispanic community um, as well, who are from Austin, right? And so you have to make sure that you have those particular types of people plugged in into those communities. Jimmy, for example, um, is from Austin, born, raised in Austin, but he didn't necessarily know the House family, right? Um, so just making sure that if you are going to have those voices, they are diverse and also from those communities as well. So, yeah. Eric, did you have something you wanted to? Um, yeah, I'm starting to see, now that I'm, I'm, I'm learning the background, what I noticed is that there was misinformation from the police based on the assumption that they made, mm -hmm. based on uh, you know, an incident that occurred near the, the bombing. Um, and then that misinformation was then passed on to us through the media. Um, so there was no due diligence um, on either part. So the department um, is not blameless in this situation either. No, and, I, and I'm not even sure we were passing everything along at that point. There were, so there were some uh, statements that were actually said publicly, the thing about he could have, been, uh, we can't rule out that it wasn't something he was doing or whatever they said that they that they were so, so we had an event last week about this and we had the police chief and we had Nelson Linder and some other folks there and uh, the police chief said you know after that after hearing one of his detectives say that and he said he walked into a room and slammed the door and said did we just tell I can't remember the age of a four-year-old or eight-year-old girl that her dad was responsible for his own death oh. Um, and, and from Mr. Linder's point of view, he, uh, among the things that, that he was regretful of, and he, he feels some personal um, guilt, that he was not in a position to uh, be a leader, warn others in Austin's African-American community, of which he is a leader, um, that this was going on because there was this really misinformation. I don't, I don't think it was intentional. I think, it, I think police try quickly, uh, we see this all the time, where they go to, they're there, it's okay, 
we don't think the public is in danger. Like that's their first um, thing they want to say. And quite often it's like, you know, really, how do you know that? How do you know the public isn't in danger? Um, and when they say those words to us in the media, that often means uh, this was a suicide. This was a, um, someone knew the, the victim. Um, some, some of these code words of, of what's going on. And they were saying these things, which turned out to be completely wrong. They had somebody running around the city leaving uh, package bombs on doorsteps and gave us no, no word of warning. But then Draylon Mason is killed. Mm -hmm. And within minutes, those who are familiar with the political leadership in the African American community know that the Draylon Mason's family mm -hmm. and House's family not only know each other, but know each other well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does the media do with that information? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not I trying would, to take Yeah, so I mean, for, for us, <laughs> I remember that, that morning, because we had just been, so we have a morning news meeting, and one of these, I was, the day before or whatever, was like, what are we doing on this bombing thing? And, um, and was frustrated that we had not done more on the very first case. And, um, then we had the, the second one, and I'm um, just like, let's get everybody on this. Like, get the investigative team. We're on this thing. And then we had a third one, mm. like two hours later, three hours later, whatever it was. Um, yeah, I think we, uh, I think from then on, you know, we were putting together the, the Freddie Dixon and Mason connection. Um, there was a Mason who lived down the street from Miss Herrera. Uh, we were... Just like the police were, we were trying to figure this stuff out and putting connections together. So I think at that point, um, the possibility that it was some kind of hate crime, some kind of racial thing, I think that was in everybody's, was, was forefront. And I think that was, came out in the coverage. We couldn't say that it was race-based. Yeah. We couldn't say that it was a hate crime because it's, it's a year not later, our we job still, to speculate. A year later, we still don't know. Yeah, but. I would say it's not our job to speculate, right? It's not, our job is to put out the facts, right? Um, so when we did find out, like I know for us, when we did find out that Draylon and um, House's family, uh, they knew each other, we made sure that we put out that information. Um, and then we made sure that we, especially after the Herrera bombing, um, we made sure that we put out that they were all people of color. That was something that stuck out and something that a lot of the people of color in our newsroom talked about. We were like, we need to make sure that that information is known. Um, so again, it's not our job to kind of come to that conclusion, but it is our job to say, House's family knew Mason's family. Herrera's family, you know, maybe there's not any connection that we know of, but we do know that these three people are of color. Yeah, so. we spent three days trying to find the woman named Mason down the street from the Herrera house. <laughs> we finally found her. And she said, oh yeah, I'm not related to them. Huh. I'm, not, I'm not from Austin, I'm from whatever, whatever her story was. But a year later, that connection remains. Mm -hmm. And if, John, you're saying we don't know, that might be true, but does that still haunt us in some ways? It does me. No, sure, I, I still wanna know um, what the overall motive was, we don't know. We, there was a recorded thing that we haven't been allowed to listen to and may never be able uh, allowed to listen to that might explain things. Um, and yeah, that, that uh, the, the bomber's background um, leads one to think that, um, yeah, that it might, there might really have been um, some racial related motive. I know listening to Mr. Linder last week, he sure thinks so. Mr. Linder? Mm hmm. Anyone else? Um, I had a question because um, I think that sort of unknown about it, mm -hmm. uh, I do think the journalist's job is to put out the facts, but kind of like those facts were sort of to me like, 
you kind of put them together and it, you know, it looked very racially motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way, uh, you know, I'm doing the ethical consideration here, I think in a way not saying it was is, you know, I found it kind of a bit sort of problematic because that's probably what everyone thought. So knowing that people might think that, mm -hmm. When you put this out, I mean, what do you, what do you do with it? We decided to say that um, people are suspecting that it's racially motivated. It's like, again, we can't say that it is unless APD says that it is. Um, so we kind of just kind of describe what the community's reaction was mm -hmm. uh, to actually affirm and to acknowledge that concern um, rather than saying that ourselves. Yes, yeah. That's how we would handle it. Yeah. Or what is the kind of threshold that we need mm -hmm to reach in order to say definitively that community members feel something akin to racial terror. Mm. So that was, to me, an interesting um, dilemma myself when I was asked to give the New York Times an op-ed on this, um, on the incident, that if I was gonna write it, I couldn't be beholden to the hate crimes threshold in order to talk about race, but I still needed to talk about race. And what was interesting is that in some of the feedback I got from the public, there were those who were apoplectic about me mentioning race because clearly the evidence didn't suggest that this was a hate crime. And I thought that was that was an interesting emotional reaction where there were some who just disavowed the racial aspects but entirely your, your piece, after that, the, that, third, the, the third or fourth did that come out after the Travis yeah. Country bombing, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. so I mean, at that point, everybody's like, oh yeah, race has nothing to do with it. Um, I'm always and, like, you know, a, do we know that? <laughs> right. you know, we, we don't know that. That's, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's but it, BS, it was but. the the, um, the force with which they dismiss this, mm -hmm. that exactly. I found to be really curious. And that's why we followed up with our reporting, right? Mm -hmm. About all of those racial tensions coming you know, to the surface. We were like, yeah, even though APD says, you know, these two white men were injured um, in this neighborhood, this is bringing up a, a larger conversation and this is a weird pattern, right? Um, and so I, I think for us, we didn't ignore that fact um, and maybe this was like a national news because all the local news that I saw as well were kind of acknowledging this. Well, you know, deal. internationally they said it was a hate crime. Yeah. I think we have to we have to be honest with ourselves. International coverage. And you know, um, you know, all niceties aside and, and trying to find thresholds, mm -hmm. um, to be honest, you're you're not wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that, you know, that it is racially motivated. Mm -hmm. Black people make up six percent of Austin. To hit black people twice, that is what point 0.36%. Uh, so what are the odds that you're going to hit a black person twice or a black home twice in Austin? 0.36%. That's not even a percent. That's not even a whole number. Um, that we have to be honest with ourselves. I think, it's, I think it's better that we're honest with ourselves to allow us to heal and move forward because we're still having this conversation a year later. Obviously, there's something there that we haven't resolved. Let's be honest. Let's talk solutions and let's move forward. I do think that in the in the realm of media now, I, I agree with you, uh, 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 Eric. Uh, I think the racial denialism is like this, the top of the ch charts in, in America now. It's just it's huge. I think it's easier to uh, actually um, it's easier to be a racist today than it is to call somebody one. That seems to be the way it is. Um, and so that's, that's an issue, I think, in society. As it's addressed in the media, though, we are in a, I think, in an environment in which there really is not a media, it's kind of an ecosystem with all these different things in it. And the messaging, you know, primarily in terms of young people is through, you know, basically social media. And so you were mentioning solutions, I know you're interested in that. You know, I, I do think to some degree, you know, that, that people need to be empowered in terms of making their own, and, and it's possible too, you know, within, you know, social media, especially among, among young people. Um, Austin does have the scattered and diffuse, you know, black community. The chances of, that's what I thought when I read the story, the chances of hitting us twice. Yeah. He'd have to, I mean, this, yeah. so it, it struck me as improbable. So as a piece of journalism, I would have written the story saying it was highly improbable that you could do that. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I also think that people these days, I think to look at the media, I used to be a person that critiqued the media all the time and say blah, 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 is really not, it's actually to be self-defeating because the influence of places like the Statesman, I think it's just kind of not, it's big here, but in terms of the ecosystem, it's not influencing people that much in, until something hits them like this. It's my, you know, my critique on media right now. The other thing too is racial terror doesn't have to be coherent. No. I mean, we, we think that in order for us to call it that, that it needs to square in some ways. It doesn't because it's racial terror. I mean, I think that one thing we're not talking about is like who makes up these newsrooms too, right? We have to talk <laughs> about that. Now, there are some people that have, um, I think that a place like NPR, which is uh, in a sense publicly, a little bit quasi publicly funded, oh. it goes on a nonprofit model. Mm -hmm. um, Increasingly, the more uh, stable news institutions are nonprofits. And there is an issue within those of uh, basically, you know, no diversity. Mm -hmm. So what, what is it like at, <laughs> put you on the spot, what's the diversity of the uh, reporting team at uh, KUT? Um, so for our particular team, we're separate from the Texas standard. Um, so for us, there's me. Um, we have one Latino woman, one Latino male. Um, we have we. Oh, not Sa Saida just left for Dallas, so uh, yeah, she's gone. Um, and then we have um, one Brazilian um, and Lebanese uh, mixed woman in our uh, in our newsroom. So that's pretty much the makeup. Um, I would say like a little over half are women. Um, and then the rest are, are men, so. Predominantly white, though, so, okay. yeah. Um, you know, I'm curious, because uh, what can people in the public do about a situation like that? I mean, anything you would suggest the public to do? About? The lack of diversity in like, these so-called nonprofit, nonpartisan news organizations. I guess I would say demand more from your newsroom. Um, but the onus isn't on the public, right? That's on us. It's on the leaders in our newsrooms. That's um, true. I've, it's, it still irritates me to this day to hear I can't find a black reporter or Hispanic reporter or Asian reporter, right? Um, what are you doing to actually go into those spaces, right? Um, so, yeah. You know, it's interesting because that was an issue, you know, when I started this business in the 70s, and it still seems to be a, a repopulated issue, except for now it seems to be in newsrooms where the, the sort of political leadership is more liberal than they certainly were in the 70s. So I think that's a sign of sort of the lasting kind of, you know, the hard it is to break up that kind of mentality. Uh, because nonprofits, uh, journalism, and that's the most influential point of journalism right now, they are quite, quite, they are quite um, monolithic in, in, their, in their background. Um, I don't know what the timing is here, but I was wondering if we have, if we wanted to have, uh, bring the audience into this discussion now? Okay. Anyone? So I said someone was gonna bring a mic around. I see a hand there, but okay, Jessica's coming with the mic. This is in my Hi. Um, I was wondering if y'all could speak to, so I think almost all of us can agree that motive is important, but why is it so important? Why would one motive mean something so different than another, and how would that affect the community? Well, well I'm, not, I'm not ready to go where these gentlemen are in terms of, I think, I think the math would tell you, okay, yeah, it's, it's hard to, it would be hard to randomly uh, pick two um, African American households and then follow it up with a Latino household. Um, I don't know. I can come up with other explanations, maybe if I want to. But uh, you know, the next ones were in a predominantly white area, and I think the we we tracked down one of the packages that was not one of them that was intercepted at the FedEx facility, and I think that was a white woman, if I recall. So we don't know how the how the guy was selecting these addresses. Um, and so just on a fact, you know, I can't go to the, um, you know, yeah, we could put in a story and the number, the, what, what is the math? What are the odds? Um, but I can't say it was one thing or another in terms of a motive because that's, we, we just don't. 
but we don't know that. I, and so the, so the motive to me, you know, is, is would be important because I, 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 I think your question was why is the motive important though? Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. yeah, I would say like a motive would have just, well, I, this is what I thought before what I'm about to tell you. So I think that a motive would have helped us kind of find maybe a simpler answer to this issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe like trying to find trends in the area, you know, was there anything that he was associated with? Um, but I actually, on Sunday, just did an interview with um, a psychologist who even talked about after these kind of like mass attacks and these events, that when you do know more information, it kind of creates more confusion, right? Or just kind of like more questions rather than answers. Um, and so like once he kind of explained that and kind of explained his research, it kind of made me think like, yeah, you know, if we had known, you know, that maybe this was racially motivated, you know, we still would have had questions at the end of the day, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that's kind of. Like I mean, I think we want we as humans want to have, yeah, we want, want to a have we want to have a, a, a simple explanation for yeah. these things, and that was one of the confounding things of this. Um, but what nineteen been days of terror and the year since is we still don't really know much. What would have been important for us is to kind of like to wrap up the story, right? To wrap up the narrative, right? We had reported so much over, like you said, 19 days, and like not to have a, like a definitive answer, right? It just kind of seems, it just doesn't seem finished, yeah. if that makes sense. But if we, so. if we move off of motive, mm -hmm. and we talk about other things like, say, disparate impact, mm -hmm. we have a story there, mm -hmm. and we have a clear narrative. I think it's, true enough to say that a particular segment of the Austin community felt specifically terrified mm -hmm. by what was happening. I agree. Yeah. And that is worth speaking about, clearly. But I think setting that was, aside- That was done, you know? Um, setting aside motive. And if it was done, then yeah, we I mean, can debate whether or not we felt it was done in a way that fully represented mm -hmm. those fears. I think there's still a chilling effect mm -hmm. to this day. I think that people still feel a level of fear about what happened. And that is a story that we can tell now. Yeah, I remember we, we did a story on, um, which we were, which church, uh, Wesley United Methodist, I think was the church that yeah. they went to, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that we were, you know, talking to, uh, uh, where the pastor saying? Um, the pastor and some of the, the congregation members. About, again, trying to put these things together. We spent a lot of time trying to put those puzzle pieces together. And I think it was all in the context of, um, gee, these people look alike and live in the same part of town. There's gotta be something going on here. It's just we could not definitively say, mm -hmm. this is what it was. And I feel like we still can't say that. Mm -hmm. And you may never be able to, and I'm sorry I know there were other hands, because I think if, you know, there's a, say, a psychological autopsy done on, um, on the bomber, and it's conclu the conclusion is that, you know, there is no political coherence to what he did, then that forecloses the discussion about racial motive, right? And so, in some ways, I don't necessarily think we need to, um, <laughs> to have that in order to have the discussion mm -hmm. about impact. impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess and, I think there's multiple, there's multiple narratives that can happen at once mm -hmm. on this story. I think there's multiple ones working here. And I think that's very difficult in media for people to get at multiple things at mm -hmm. once. Absolutely. And I don't think the, uh, I don't think you, you asked why is it more important to have this motive than that motive? I don't think it is. I think just the, the lack of of knowing the lack of um, knowing what his motive was in light of all the, where the evidence points, that causes anxiety and fear and, and the trauma doesn't stop. And so we can't heal unless we have answers. Um, I think that's where we are. So any motive, if it turns out he rolled the dice, um, then I think that would allow us to start healing from there. And to me, the, the bigger, the, the big racial story that, that came out of this 
um, was, and, and you, you, you touched at it first, I think, in your piece, or one of the first, yeah. um, was that this pointed uh, out the racial division mm -hmm. that we have in the city um, that started a long time ago, still exists today, uh, maybe is even more so now because of displacement of so many people. Um, it goes through the school district, it goes through where we live, it goes through um, income, uh, lack of income mobility, which we're way down on the list in terms of that. Um, and that we think of ourselves as this progressive city in so many ways, yet um, uh, in, this, in this regard, we, we're, we're not very far along. And, and so I, I think the, the, the bombings in Austin and race to me, that was the thing that was sort of the long, the, the longer tail story um, out of it all was kind of showing this to the rest of the world. The rest, us, those of us here know this, um, but to the rest of the world to show, okay, hey, liberal progressive Austin doesn't walk the walk. Quite we as have much a hand here. Just to just get one Hi, good evening. I'm sorry. Um, I, we know that media plays a tremendous impact on shaping the narrative, and so. As it relates to race, um, you know, hindsight's 2020. You talked a little bit about that earlier. And here we are a year later. How have your organizations um, incorporated a racial discussion to, make, to take steps to, to have a better understanding of the racial impact in Austin? Um, have those discussions happened and or what changes have been made? Or are you willing to make internally so that the community can have a different perspective in future reportings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for us, we did a uh, lot of follow up um, after the fact with um, with uh, the neighbors, right? So like, I just uh, did a story where I went to the um, the neighborhood where house where house lived, and then I went to the neighborhood where um, her river lived, right? And I wanted to show this this difference, right, um, in the type of of, of how everybody was traumatized, but in very different ways, right? Um, so, you know, this, this white woman, you know, lives in this suburban neighborhood and how she's healing, and then this uh, Latino, Latina, sorry, woman, um, and how she's kind of dealing with it, right? This woman who has access to psychology, right? To therapy, this woman who, they really don't even talk about it anymore, right? It's kind of like you have to, you know, kind of move on. So I think that that's like one aspect of how we're, deal we're kind of, dealing with it, um, and then as well as talking to Manly, and even you know, bringing up the racial issues um, that came along with the case. Um, and then as a newsroom, we meet together and we're, we're, we're talking to each other, like what could we have done differently next time? Um, when do we say something is racist or racially, racially charged, which is something that irritates me to this day? <laughs> um, so yeah, just making sure that we're checking back in with each other um, and also the community, so. Uh, yeah, we had lots of discussions at the time, and um, we did a, a long piece uh, after the fact that was kind of echoed what, what you had written um, uh, about the larger uh, racial impact in Austin and touched on a lot of things we've talked about here today. Um, uh, but to me, the, the more basic thing is, is just basic reporting. It doesn't matter what color the skin, you know, I mean, for a while there, I don't think we knew the color of the skin of the victim. It's, it's the reporting into pushing against the police narrative, um, that kind of piece, where I felt like we had a couple of days go by of lost time. And that, to me, was, to me, that's the biggest regret of, of our uh, reporting, was that it felt like we weren't on our A game. It doesn't matter what, what the color of the victim was. Uh, in that regard, it was just like we, didn't do as good I was as wondering job. to what degree, on doors as we should what, have. To what degree does the you know, economic downturn in terms of you know, revenues for newspapers, to what degree did that affect your ability to cover, I mean, anything, but is it particularly impactful in an emergency situation? Well, I think you have a lot less staff. Yeah, there's a lot fewer of us. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we have a newsroom of 80 something people today, and uh, we would have had more last year, and we, you know, uh, 15 years ago, would have had a newsroom of 205 or something when, when Jay worked there. Um, but, 
So yeah, there are fewer of us. We're staffed less on weekends. There are fewer of us to say, hey, why are we following up on this? We're more likely to get distracted by the next thing. You know, I think that same day we had the jeweler get shot out in wherever he got shot. Um, that whole case was going on. You know, the one, the, the son allegedly did it. Um, so when things are happening, we are people, we get distracted. Um, and so that happens and we don't always follow up. We're, we're not this monolithic uh, thing where we sit around after the fact and I'll smoke cigars and you know, hey, what do we do? It's in the moment. It's a bunch of people in a room saying, okay, you do this, okay, this didn't work out, let's move on to that. And um, uh, yeah, we, we make mistakes in that regard. I have a question here. I think it was two and then one day. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about kind of like what the journalistic threshold is to bring race into the picture. Like if the police say it, then everybody is allowed to repeat what the police said. And like journalistic standards are important, but it seems like there are multiple thresholds that we're talking about. Like if a church talks about being racially scared, then you can report on that racial fear. But um, it seems like we have some conflicting impulses here towards being more scared of uh, saying it in the first place and uh, less scared and, and being wrong than of uh, saying it at all. Right? Sorry. <laughs> like, Sorry. Better to That's not say question. it than to be wrong. Um, yeah, we're not going to be wrong about that. That's a great question. I mean, we're... Well, yeah. for, I don't know about anybody else. And just experience. where that line changes over yeah. time, and if this has changed where that line is. Again, I think that it really matters on the makeup of your newsroom, right? Um, so I don't think that... And not to put, like, KUT kind of, like, up, you know, above the fire or anything, but I, I don't think that KUT has an as a news organization has had certain conversations um, about race um, until like folks like me or like, you know, some of my colleagues of color have gotten there, right? Um, and I think that that threshold changes when you get people like me, right, in that newsroom or when you actually have your news organization do like maybe even a diversity workshop because a lot of places don't do that as well. Um, so I know for me, what like, after this Draylen one and then after the Herrera one, I was like, we gotta call this, like, it, it's something racist about this. I was like, we, we have to call it out, like, <laughs> right? But, but oh, sorry. But, you know, as a reporter, I can't make that last call. That's my editor's last call, too. Um, and so I think that that onus kind of falls more on the leadership of the newsroom um, as well, because I'm gonna say it, like, <laughs> I'm gonna let you know. But again, my editor gets the last call on that, so. I, I, I wouldn't say that at that point. I mean, uh, we said what we said, which was um, all of these were in East Austin, Southeast Austin, um, uh, black and Latino households, fear of the community, fear that it's racially motivated, all those, those, those are the words we use. We don't say race-based killings, no. bombings through Austin. Mm -hmm. I, we say I gotta know. A suspected I gotta know racist something. incident or something that's racially related, you know. Yeah. There was this question here, and then here. here. <coughs> that one right here. Okay, there's three. Okay. <coughs> uh, I'm Phyllis Walder, and um, I have a question about validation. <coughs> How much of a part of um, the reporting had to do with validation? going back to the very first person who was killed, Mr. House. Mr. House was not validated. Mm -hmm. His name, as you said, was not mentioned until Monday. He had to be validated yeah, in order to have the news media do a more thorough investigation. Two weeks passed, and he hadn't been validated. And, and for me, that's a concern. Why couldn't this man, who was just a father, a husband, living in a community, who was murdered, why did he have to be validated? 
for someone to care that he had died mm -hmm. in the presence of his child. So I'm, I, my question is, how much of a part of validation does investigating this kind of crime play in what the news media does? Thank you. I can speak to what we did. Um, so that, that, that's, that's the point I was making to my own newsroom a couple of days in was sort of like, I feel like we haven't gone back to, to this, um, to tell the story of who this guy was um, soon enough. Um, uh, and, and that was, again, there are lots of reasons for that, but um, I don't think any were racially related. I just think we didn't do a very good job. Um, and by the end of that, Week, I felt like we had told a, a, a decent story of of who he was, but it, it took too long. Um, yeah, there were lots of reasons for that. And I think I spoke to those. I would have to say <clears throat> that it may, and thank you, Ms. Holder, for your question. I, I, I think it's a very important question, mm -hmm. and it may always take too long. Once you get the narrative wrong, that kind of sticks. And as a black man, after Trayvon Martin, and I, after I saw how he was portrayed, I went on my social media, I removed everything that if I died that day could, could incriminate me as a thug <laughs> or as somebody who wasn't an educated person with a master's degree. I took yeah. everything down, all the pictures of me and my family that, you know, whatever. Um, be, because, and I'm not sure if all of you have done that. Have, have you all done that? Maybe I'm not. Maybe, we, yeah. right, we may have different experiences, but that's my experience as a black man because I know that the, the due diligence may not be done in my case if something happens to me. And it's, it's a pattern that's it's all too prevalent. And maybe it's time that media takes a look at that and understands that. Maybe it's the first time they're hearing that, but saying that, okay, in these cases, for whatever reason, implicit bias, whatever you want to call it, it's happening. Mm -hmm. So let's make a, an intentional effort to dig deeper to find out who people really are. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think uh, that that's our responsibility to communicate with each other, right? Or to hold these like community conversations, right? Um, and to talk about, you know, why the news media, it, media is apprehensive about calling something a certain thing, but also hearing from the community, right? And, and listening to exactly that reason right there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The social media one's interesting uh, story and uh, scrubbing your own, own page is interesting. Um, in just the opposite case here with the bomber, we had a couple hour heads, we knew who he was. Um, I knew who he was at three something in the morning, or I had a name, and I was going, I was all over his Facebook page, uh, screenshotting everything I could get. And um, so we were, and we were going through his friends, listed on his Facebook page for hours, and trying to match people up and find people, um, get out to a, his house, his parents' house uh, that morning uh, before daylight, again, before his name was ever out there. Um, and anyway, so yeah, we do that. And we form a narrative based off of what we find on that social page. And I can, oh, yeah. I, yeah. That's the, why point, I the point is well taken. Yes. That's why I deleted any yeah. pictures that yeah. could, you know, yeah. We're over. We're good. Why don't we keep on? I don't know. It's all good. Hi, I just wanted to say um, I think that we also have to acknowledge that when the media does not take a, um, a forward step in calling something terroristic or um, racist, that communities of color get hurt, mm -hmm. right? Because it almost leaves us, and I, I would imagine that Nelson Linder, that this is probably what he said, yeah. but it almost leaves us defenseless, mm -hmm. right? And, and I feel like that there's a history of that by not forewarning or preparing communities of color to take more of a defense against something. I know my own experience was that, well, first of all, you know, my son and Draylen were very, very close. Mm -hmm. So so hearing that, you know, already quickly put me on the defense, right? 
I know that everybody didn't have those connections and everything. So I immediately called my, you know, don't go to the door, don't get any packages, don't, don't go outside. Um, and, and, and so anyway, I just feel like there has to be, there has to be more accountability to the media when it comes to preparing the community to be, to have, to have some defense, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Secondly, that, that, that notion of validation is so super duper important because what if Draylen did not play the cello? Mm. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, you know? oh yeah. Like what if he didn't play the cello, you yeah. know? Um, Oh so God, I just, I, I feel like there's so, there's so many deep racist issues with the way that this story was, was even put out that, I mean, we still to this day um, are still just kind of like pitter pattering around. So anyway. Hi, Mimi, by the way. Um, but speaking about that, like the, the chillo thing, right? And that was something that I like brought up in our newsroom. I was like, even though this, this, you know, Draylen was an amazing musician, right? But that's not what makes his life valuable, right? Mm -hmm. And this was something that I was kind of making sure that I repeated over and over again, is like, his life isn't, his life isn't valuable because he was, you know, gonna get this scholarship and all of that, but I was like, let's just look at him as a human being, not as this young black boy who just happened to be very talented, right? Um, and. I, I think that that was like a perfect example. That's something that just kept burning me and that's something that still burns me today, even like looking back on like the coverage a year later, you know, this very talented, you know, young teen. And it's like, no, you know, this was a young boy killed. You know, if Draylen had been white, would we have lived with the fact that he played the cello, right? So. Well, I, I think we want, we want information and, and that's, um, sorry for your loss there. Uh, but we want information and that was, that was the frustrating part with um, Stefan Houses. That was for so many days we didn't have a name. And then in our case, I don't think we did a very good job immediately afterward. Uh, Esperanza Herrera, I still don't know a whole lot about her. And we've tried, um, but people around her don't want to don't want to talk, don't want to tell us that story. Do you know why though, John? Do you, I think do just you... privacy. I mean, her, you know, I mean, um, her injuries were Pretty catastrophic, and uh, for what we know, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. And it, and it might be that they are uh, the family members are suspicious of us and yeah. not trusting of us and all that kind of stuff. That may well be, um, but we've tried many. We we went back a year later. We still haven't had much much luck there. Same with the the the, the two two boys out in uh, or young men out in Travis Country. Um, Mm -hmm. We knew a little bit about them because we lucked into a friend of one of theirs called us or something like that. And um, but we, you know, they still haven't really, really told their story, and we don't we haven't really done I, much on them. Can I answer your question about why they wouldn't want to talk to us? I think that we, outside of these bombings, we need to do a better job of reporting on these communities day, in the yeah. first place. Yeah. We it, we don't need to just go there whenever something catastrophic happens. And this is why there is a mistrust with the media is because we aren't there when everyday events happen. Um, yeah, I, and I think that that's something that we have not acknowledged, so yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Hello, thank you all for being here. My question is kind of leading up in this conversation, including the community, a couple of weeks after um, KUT held an event um, in East Austin and asked members of the community to come up and the intermittent police chief was there. Do you think that event helped the community heal? Do you think we should have more of those types of events of bringing out the community to speak to these members and having it broadcasted? Or do you think for the members of the community and leaders in the community, was that more of a show? I can't answer that aspect of it. Uh, but what I can say is it depends on what your definition of healing is, right? Um, and then also people heal in very different ways. Um, I think that that event answered a lot of questions. I think that we had conversations that we weren't able to have without it, but I don't think that it solved the issue, right? Um, so I think that it, it, it acknowledged our feelings, but not necessarily fixed the issue. I think that that is more on like, just like the city and, and just kind of making sure that we're doing that work. Like, Again, going back to my story that I did, 
the year after coverage, I asked Chaz Moore, I said, so, you know, Mayor Adler talked about knowing your neighbor, talked about reaching out more, right? So what is the city doing right now to kind of cultivate those conversations and those relationships? We haven't heard of anything, right? We have all these memorials for the victims, which mm -hmm. is rightfully so, but we're still not having these conversations. And I think that that needs to start happening more consistently rather than a month later or a year later when the anniversary comes up, so. I think we are, uh, should I stop now? <laughs> okay, we'll take one more. Yeah. And then we can continue the, con we'll have a reception and we can continue yeah. talking over wine and beer. <laughs> So there was some, okay. Thank you all for doing this. Um, and Eric Bird, sorry for, for not saying your name and introducing you all. Eric works with, uh, is the Vice President of Measure Austin, mm -hmm. which is a racial justice and data organization that works really closely with police. Police are a key part of mm -hmm. this story. And I, I guess, I guess my question is the relationship between police or officials mm. and media, particularly the police, given the relationship with communities of color, how do you, with nuance, develop that relationship and report what is officially provided by the police? Jump in. Um, so, uh, yeah, for us, um, we have some good sourcing within some official channels, not just the police department, but prosecutors and others um, who will tell us stuff, which is very helpful. Um, they're telling you, uh, they're they're not always telling you their version of, of things. Sometimes they're telling you how they screwed up. Um, but they're, they're, you know, they are a source. So there's the official what they're saying, and then there's the <coughs> stuff that they're not ready to say yet or that they only want to say off the record or whatever. And then we have to go find some other way to, to validate it and get it in, into print. Um, you know, at the same time, so, so there, there's this buddy-buddy relationship that goes on with sources and, and um, officials. At the same time, um, you know, uh, most police don't like us. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, we are very critical of, no, uh, like of, of what they do. Um, and we report on all the bad things they do, or the ones we know about. Um, so it's, I, I think, like a lot of things, it's a complicated uh, relationship. You know, it, it sort of brought up a question to me, though, because I know that um, in the case of, uh, I'm sorry, her name escapes me, the, the school teacher. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jackson, was her name? Yes. Uh, uh, no, um, Bri no, Brianna. Oh, oh Brianna, Brianna King. King. Yes, King. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, the, the those first. tapes, like, came out, like, a year later. Mm -hmm. And they were they came out because media I uh, think sort of went for them. We got, we got the story. And, and you, yeah, you went to it. Yeah. I'm curious why you can't get this tape of this boy's confession. Um, That's because APD won't release it. Well, I know, but you you know, I mean, isn't that uh, if it's in their possession, isn't that then of some kind of public record? It's still it, an open case, right? They they still consider it an open investigation. Yeah. And when they say those words, they can trump anything in the Texas Open yeah. uh, Public Information Act. Yeah. Um, well, and do you think that's it? Well, I, I want to ask I mean, you the police chief says it's that that true. The, I mean, the police chief last week uh, said if it were up to him, it will never yeah. be made public. Um, and he, so this was one where he and, and, and uh, Nelson Lunder just, you know, Nelson Lunder's like, I want to know what this is because I, I need explanation and I think this is um, white domestic terrorism, pretty much what he said. Um, and we need to hear this to stop other people like him, like this, this guy. Um, and the police chief is saying that um, he doesn't want to um, validate, to steal your word, he doesn't want to give any more voice to, to, the, to the bomber to yeah. inspire I think copycats. It's a, I think it's a complicated line to tell. Like, 
even if we did have access to the tape, um, it's more of, you know, would we air the tape? Would we just say what he said in the tape? How do you, how do you express what this man had done in this video without actually validating him, right? Um, yeah. Which is what it seems like his intention was, was he wanted that intention. Yeah, we would have that conversation. Of, do we, yeah. we would run the words, no doubt. Yeah. Um, it's a question of do we of how, do well, we do the do we do any yeah. media organization uh, pressing the police or suing the police to get this thing released? We haven't sued them, uh, or, but we we uh, yeah. Well, yeah. right now there's the way the Texas Public Information Act works. There's really nothing to do. They, yeah. they can they can say these magic words and and shut everything down. Yeah. Um, but a different police chief could have a different decision about that, right? Uh, potentially, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway. Um, I know we all there. want a yeah. motive, but it's just very interesting. I know that it was because of the media pressure that the tapes uh, for, for the, the King case. Yeah, so the King case, uh, so I mean, that was, that was a result of good source work by Tony Plahesky on our staff. Um, I can't remember exactly how that one came about. I just remember Tony coming in and telling me, I got a line on this thing, somebody's gonna give me these tapes. I'm like, awesome, let's, let's watch them. Um, and it took, a, it took some negotiating to get them, and I, th I don't think they were, I think they were coming from, I think they were coming like from her lawyer or something like that. I don't think they came from police. Um, police did not want those out. Yeah. And um, yeah, and you, so it became of, I also, became of that. I also think that these are two very different cases oh, yeah, as well, right? Sure. Um, and the result from seeing these would be very, no. Two different results, I, I think. I, I agree. I agree. I was just curious because yeah. I know that the media was instrumental in, 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 in one instance. Yeah. Uh, is there another question? Are we wrapped up for the evening? <laughs> there was one way on the back. He's had her hand up a long time. And since we're way over. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Lauren. Thank you all for being here. So my question is that while with this particular incident, um, with it, it could have been racially profiled or having that motive, it's hard to say definitively, though what's interesting about it is it uniquely created fear across the community, I think, for many peoples. Mm -hmm. um, and so what my question is, I'm curious in terms of when you are in the, the position of shaping a public narrative as presented in the media on something of this nature that has like a widespread impact, what strategies do you have to like check yourself and your own assumptions or bias, biases of what um, could have shaped it or what could have sparked it for the sake of, as a community, us like further awakening to the higher truths of just where we are as a society and where we want to go? Because it's easy for those of us who do believe in just like there are disparities that there are, or the disparities that there are amongst several racial, I mean, several societal institutions. It's harder for those who are not ready to dive into that conversation. So I think with situations like this, that do create fear amongst just the community at large and in general. It's a, it's a time for us to think about how can we present it in a way where all of us are willing to lean in and hopefully as a collective go beyond where we are currently. So, so the, the about, question, like, the, the strategies that you use to kind of check yourself, yeah. to present something in a more robust way, to so that the audience can embrace it where they're at and hopefully awaken to mm. broader truths if they're not ready to take parts of the story. I would say just different angles. That's like a, I don't know if that's an answer at all. Um, sure. I know that's what we did. So we did. We did story coverage of the actual bombing events, um, and we mentioned about like the race and, and all of that, and you know, APD not calling it terrorism. But we also did like a whole separate story about the race issue in Austin, <laughs> um, as well. So maybe like different aspects of, of this thing. So yeah, I think it's it's that, and then internally, you know, we have these conversations all the time. Like, do we want to name this guy? Whatever the case is, do we? What are we saying here? By playing this on the front page, what are we saying? Mm -hmm. These are conversations we, we don't get it right all the time and we disagree uh, among ourselves and sometimes we regret the way we did something um, or people. But, um, but we have those conversations and we do have a diverse group of people 
asking those questions in the room. Um, that happens, but, but we don't we don't always do it right. But we try. One of the thresholds to us is: Did we at least talk about it? Like before we ran the picture or whatever the controversial thing is of the mm -hmm. day, um, did we at least have a conversation? We might have screwed up, but did we at least talk about it? Um, Jay will remember those conversations from photo. Like, did we at least talk about whether we're going to run the dead body on the front page? Um, and that, I don't know, that, that, that gives us some solace, at least, that we're going through a process of, like, did we ask the questions? Did we press against uh, each other's um, thoughts? And, um, yeah, did we at least have the conversation? Getting um, feedback. We get emails all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, we may do a survey or something like that. So just making sure that we're not only looking inwardly at ourselves, but how is the community looking at us and what ways that can we, you know, fix that and check ourselves um, when we need to. So. Okay. Well, I think, uh, gentlemen, would you have any last words? Eric Bird. Um, I, well, first of all, um, I'd like to thank Victor and um, the Future Forum for inviting us out here. I think these, these conversations are extremely important. I think we haven't come to the point where we've, we've, um, we've had any resolution. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been um, a combination of different factors. Uh, um, but I think, I think it's important that we know what's on the tape. Mm -hmm. And at, at which point, um, it's also important that it's filtered in the right way. Um, irresponsibly, so it doesn't incite any copycat or anything like that. We, we don't want this to continue. Um, but it's important to know because we need to know what factors to watch out for. We need to know what conversations to have, um, where we can pinpoint and target our, our surgical, surgical strike against whatever the motive is. Um, and so, yeah. That's... You know, one of the things that I think is really important when we look at the situation in Austin and March 2018, years from now, is how would this have played out in another city, a pure city? Mm. You know, what is it about Austin that this event articulated in the way that it did? Meaning, you have a context where these populations on the east side are already feeling endangered and their institutions have been um, hollowed out by not just the housing market and what's happening by way of gentrification, but also, in my view, by years and years of neglect when it comes to resolving Austin's long race and class inequalities. And so that's the context in which this is happening, a context where people already feel endangered. And I think that, to me, was not there, contextually there. And so people will say, well, well hey, how, how is this happening in this particular city, right? Or, um, or what's going on in Austin? This seems so strange. And I think if we had a sustained discussion around these hard truths, then the reaction of surprise mm. and Austin exceptionalism and, wow, this is anomalous, doesn't crowd out the discussion about what's really happening. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's a good place to end it. Um, thank you all for coming out. Thank the panelists. Um, I really enjoyed our experience.